Okay, I can see that we're still waiting for some people to join, but I think we will actually get started right away. So welcome everyone who have already joined. Um, we're very excited to have you. And uh, yeah, we're hoping that this will be a very inspiring and uh, useful uh, seminar for all of you. Uh, just some uh, housekeeping rules is that we have a Q&A box down on the toolbar where you can uh, write any questions that you have. and. Uh, if anyone thinks that anyone has a specifically interesting question, then you can upvote that question so that we will have that one at the top in our toolbar. Uh, then we have, if there are any comments from the audience, feel free to put that in the chat, just so we're separating the two of them. And our panelists will also be trying to answer your questions in the, uh, the Q&A box. So uh, yes, again, very much welcome to this event. I hope that you're all excited, depending on if it's uh, the morning or afternoon or evening. So yes, let's get started. So uh, basically, just some uh, background to this event is um, it's on climate change, of course. And as most of us know, is that climate change is having detrimental effects on the pursuit of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And uh, uh, limiting the warming to any temperature level requires uh, stabilization of atmospheric greenhouse gas uh, concentrations by achieving net zero GHG emissions. Uh, this means that all remaining emissions are counterbalanced by natural or technical sinks or removals into long-term storage. So uh, such carbon dioxide removal technologies, also called CDRs, uh, include ocean CDR, which is the removal of uh, CO2 from upper ocean waters, uh, which is a key element of the CDR portfolio and an essential component to reducing atmospheric CO2 levels. Uh, however, implications of technologies and practices from remo removing CO2 uh, from the ocean are not fully understood and have not yet been mapped against the full range of SDGs. Uh, lucky for us, today we have a great lineup of panelists to discuss ocean-based carbon dioxide removal and its implications for the SDGs. Um, and this is part of Cambridge Net Zero Climate Change Festival 2022. So without fur further ado, I will just go ahead and introduce our panelists. And I'll be starting with uh, Andrew Hudson, uh, he is the head of the Water and Ocean Governance Program in UNDP's Bureau for Policy and Program Support. He oversees and provides strategic policy and technical guidance, guidance on all aspects of the development, implementation, and evaluation of UNDP's work in water and ocean government governance. And uh, currently he has a portfolio worth of uh, $450 million working in 100 countries. Uh, he received his uh, BS and MS in Earth and Planetary Science from MIT and was a doctoral student in uh, oceanography at the University of Rhode Island and received his PhD in Environmental Science from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Then we have uh, Christian Telecki, and he has spent the last two decades working on the ground uh, and at the highest level of ocean policy and science, as well as environment, sustainability, and development, uh, along with building and leading innovative partnerships and initiatives to improve ocean health. In addition to serving as director of the Sustainable uh, Ocean Initiative at the World Resources Institute, uh, Christian is the director of the Friends of Ocean Action for the World Economic Forum and head of the Secretariat of the High Level Panel uh, for a Sustainable Ocean Economy. Christian is also one of the board members uh, of environmental development and uh, social initiatives, and he has a degree uh, from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Cambridge University. Then we have uh, Dr. Brian von Hudson, and he is the founder and executive director uh, of the Climate uh, Foundation, uh, which upholds the vision and the mission to regenerate life in the ocean using marine permaculture technology. As the executive uh, director, Brian leads the Climate Foundation's large-scale seaweed mariculture program uh, to develop sustainable food, feed, and fertilizer value chains, as well as provide uh, ecosystem life support and sustainable blue carbon sink. Uh, Brian graduated uh, magna cum laude from Princeton University with a degree in physics. He also holds uh, a PhD in planetary science from Caltech, where he was awarded the 
prestigious um, Hertz Fellowship and uh, has also been awarded numerous patents. And uh, last but not least, we have Romani Webb, and uh, she is an associate uh, research scholar at the Columbia Law School and senior fellow at the Sabin uh, Center for Climate Change uh, Law. Uh, Romani's research focuses on two primary areas, which is energy and negative emissions technologies. Uh, Romani's energy-related research explores how legal and policy tools can be used to minimize uh, the climate impact of energy development, as well as the impacts of uh, climate change on um, energy infrastructure. Um, she also researches legal uh, issues associated uh, with the development and deployment of negative emissions technologies on land and in the oceans. Uh, she also serves as the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine Committee uh, on Ocean Carbon Dioxide Removal and Sequestration. Uh, she's also the co-chair of the Climate Change Sustainable Development and Ecosystem Committee of the American Bar Association Section on Environment, Energy and Resources. And uh, yes, I forgot myself. <laughs> My name is Linda Johnson, and I am an associate expert at the Marine and International Waters Unit at uh, the UN Environment Program in Nairobi. And I'm currently managing um, a very diverse portfolio with several projects on sustainable ecosystem management. And more specifically, I work on uh, coral reefs, mangroves, and seaweeds in the Southeast Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean. I also used to work at, uh, at UNEP in Dar es Salaam on uh, illegal wildlife and forest crimes in Eastern Africa. And uh, I have a, a master's in rural development and natural resource management from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, as well as a master's in journalism. So uh, with that um, hopefully brief introduction of everyone, I'm actually gonna hand it over to Brian for the first presentation. So Brian, please go ahead. Thank you, Linda. And can you hear me okay? Yeah, all good. Um, very good, that sounds great. Well, thank you. It's great to be joining you today and uh, to discuss uh, marine permaculture and our work at the Climate Foundation. We are uh, in the process of ensuring food security for a billion people who depend on the ocean for their primary sustenance. Regenerating those marine ecosystems is going to be an essential part of what we do going forward. And then measuring the carbon balance and the carbon export of the quarter of seaweed that falls off these platforms during growth sinks a thousand meters a day to the abyssal seafloor and documenting that where it's potentially sequestered for centuries is going to be a very important aspect of what we do going forward. That was the basis for our uh, being very fortunate to be recognized as um, XPRIZE winners for the uh, milestone of uh, carbon removal. And uh, that's a key milestone towards the 2025 uh, grand prizes that we're interested in really demonstrating uh, scalable uh, nature-based ocean solutions that can really uh, ensure food security, regenerate uh, ecosystems, and enable large-scale carbon export in the process. Uh, this Lee paper from 2020 in Nature Climate Change uh, discusses the increasing stratification in the ocean, particularly uh, this interesting schematic has a cylinder representing the Southern Ocean, Pacific Ocean on the right, and Atlantic and Indian Oceans on the left. The red zones represent zones where the upwelling uh, has been diminished. Uh, stra stable stratification of the mixed layers effectively represent over the last 60 years, a five to 20% increase in stratification in the mixed layer. That is uh, a key barrier to having the pre-industrial level of natural upwelling that is essential for seaweed macroalgae to grow as well as microalgae. Charlie Varon in the Royal Society lecture of 2008 articulated how the coral reefs represent uh, the canaries in the coal mine. And before each mass extinction, uh, there, is, there tends to be uh, coral bleaching and coral demise. This has occurred uh, during each major mass extinction and represents a key risk going forward. And so I think that's our challenge is to actually uh, address this because as early as 250 million years ago, these kind of stratification scenarios in the oceans resulted in a loss of up to 96% of all marine species. It's important that we not get tar carbon tunnel vision. In other words, one of the essential tenets of permaculture is that 
multiple benefits accrue from a single intervention. And that has to start with food security for, uh, for people and for natural ecosystems. And it has to include regenerative um, dimensions in terms of keeping the biodiversity of our oceans alive. Because if we got to zero carbon, but we were on a dead planet, would we really have succeeded? So it's absolutely essential that we have the life support systems, if you will, for the planet uh, moving along with us in a healthy way. We have seen these stratification events in Southeast Asia result in more than 60% production losses. During these years of marine heat waves, half the seaweed farms oftentimes go abandoned. And this represents a key economic loss as well. And the solution of marine permaculture potentially can restore natural upwelling, restore algae production and seaweed cultivation, and ultimately uh, regenerate that primary production that produces fish habitat and uh, as well as food products and, uh, and feed supplements. Now, there are several ways of doing this, and one of them is through deep water irrigation using deep cycling. And that's where the sunlight acts like a sponge and absorbs sunlight and, and carbon dioxide during the day. Uh, in the evening, it's lowered down below the neutrocline where it absorbs nitrate and phosphate, uh, soaks it up like a sponge. And then during the day, it uh, again absorbs sunlight and CO2 from the surface mixed layer, the top meters. This represents a very energy effective way of doing the deep water irrigation. There are other times and places where uh, upwelling is needed directly, but these represent multiple avenues towards identifying these solutions. Another equally important part is that when we do submerge the seaweed platforms, as we did during Super Typhoon Rye of December 2021, a Category 5 hurricane, we um, managed to get an enormous amount of typhoon resilience. And so uh, we have perhaps the only uh, hurricane proven moored seaweed platform on the planet at the moment, having survived this Category 5 hurricane. The platform, some five meters below the surface, not only survived intact, but had most of the seaweed on it. And the day after the hurricane, we were growing seaweed again. And by um, the following six months, we were able to deliver a quarter ton of seedlings to other communities in the Philippines to enable their seaweed farms to regenerate again. So it represents a great opportunity with a dozen value chains, starting with food, feed, and uh, biostimulants and other agricultural amendments that have the promise of potentially reducing the amount of nitrate fertilizer that's needed on terrestrial crops while maintaining yields, and those reductions can approach 20%. We're also very happy to see that with deep water irrigation, we're able to regenerate the uh, and rescue the production of seaweed shown in green uh, under uh, deep water irrigation scenarios relative to the red lines that represent controls, which are during the one more warm months, the seaweed isn't growing much at all. And um, we're managing to scale through a number of stages, having completed a 100 square meter platform last year, and now we're in the midst of completing a tenth of a hectare this year and are anticipating doing an economically sustainable hectare next year to demonstrate the business models that will enable this to continue. While we're growing the seaweed, we can also be fixing a high amount of carbon. Some estimates show that uh, seaweed forests can fix 15% more carbon than even a tropical rainforest. And so being able to apply that to the open ocean where we're providing deep water substrate and we're also providing the deep water irrigation uh, enables us to utilize vast areas of mostly empty ocean that can be near shore using local seaweeds or further offshore where we're still in the exclusive economic zones but we're able to enable some of that empty ocean to uh, return to productivity, even in a, a stratified world. There have been a number of papers that uh, discuss the role of outwelling and uh, sinking of seaweed that occurs naturally. And it's natural for 20% or more of the seaweed to fall off these platforms during growth and sink a thousand meters a day. Uh, the atmosphere is represented by this black uh, carbon uh, region here. Uh, the anthropogenic carbon represents about a third of that black square and actually um, returning that back to the middle and deep ocean from whence it originally came and was early deposited represents an opportunity if it's done in a sustainable way that enables the biological pump to continue to remove carbon from the mixed layer and return it to the middle and deep ocean where there's a vast reservoir of some 38,000 gigatons. By some estimates uh, at 300 meters depth, uh, there's uh, over a century of sequestration and uh, many centuries of sequestration at depths beyond 1,000 meters. The ages of the water have been measured by radiocarbon dates, and they've also been uh, estimated 
time to the next outcropping, which can be many centuries to a millennium. Ultimately, by measuring the seaweed flux falling off the platforms, we can actually uh, get a direct measurement of the differential amount of um, seaweed and carbon that gets uh, sunk very quickly to the seafloor. There are alternative and more classical methods, including sediment traps for doing these measurements as well. Uh, RPE at the Department of Energy has estimated that 182,000 square kilometers or less, or roughly 1%, actually less than 1% of just one ocean is enough to do gigaton scale carbon fixation. And then uh, once the food security needs are met, it can actually address some other aspects as well. We're very happy to have the support of many uh, organizations in this effort. And we're looking forward to your questions and discussion regarding sustainable food security that we can get with uh, seaweed uh, offshore cultivation, the ecosystem services and habitat that can be regenerated offshore, um, but close enough to uh, the existing habitats, and ultimately the scalable uh, carbon export that's possible from the seaweed that does fall off these platforms during growth. And uh, look forward to talking with you more about that. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Brian. That was very informative. And it's always nice to hear about the, the progress in seaweeds and the carbon sequestration for sure. So thank you so much. Um, yes, for all of those of you who have just joined us, don't forget to uh, post any questions that you have in the Q&A function down in the toolbar. And if you have any comments to any of the panelists, you can also just put that in the chat. So don't be shy, but feel free to, uh, yeah, there's one question. Excellent, great. And um, if you don't mind, I, it's very okay to be anonymous, but it's also nice to see uh, who it comes from. So if anyone wants to post their name, that's also nice. Thank you. And I will now hand over to Romani. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Share my screen here. Well, thanks everyone for having me. I want to talk today about um, the international governance framework for ocean CDR. And so I'll just very briefly introduce um, existing, some of the existing governance frameworks and explain why, um, in my view, they're not sufficient to ensure um, ocean carbon dioxide removal occurs in a sort of sustainable way that is consistent with and advances the SDGs. Before I do that though, I just want to briefly explain what I mean when I say ocean CDR or ocean carbon removal, um, because I think different people use that term in different ways. Um, so I use that term to refer to a suite of techniques or approaches that um, use the ocean to effectively absorb and durably store carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So the goal here is, of course, to reduce the atmospheric carbon dioxide load. Um, and you can see some of the commonly discussed techniques in this graphic, which I took from a 2022 National Academies, US National Academies of Science report. Um, one of the key findings from that report was that we need further research to evaluate the efficacy of these different techniques and to fully assess their risks and benefits. Um, we're already seeing a lot of funding for research from governments around the world. Um, in the US where I am, there's also been really a huge amount of private sector investment in ocean CDR. We're starting to see um, a number of sort of new startups being established with the goal of uh, commercializing various ocean CDR techniques. Um, so really on the cusp of um, a new industry around ocean CDR and how that industry develops will of course have big implications, not only for efforts to address climate change, but also for um, sustainable development. So I want to touch just very briefly on um, some of the ways I see ocean CDR interacting with the SDGs. Um, and I think it's important to note that uh, these interactions are going to look different for different ocean CDR techniques. But at the most general level, as we've already heard, you know, unmitigated climate change poses a risk to or um, threatens achievement of the SDGs. And so to the extent that ocean CDR um, helps to mitigate climate change, it also helps to reduce that risk. But beyond that, you know, different um, ocean CDR techniques will have sort of differing implications for different um, SDGs. So we've already been we've already heard about seaweed cultivation. Um, I'll just note that you know if you think about seaweed cultivation, that could have benefits in terms of SDG eight um, on decent work and economic growth because it could create um, you know additional jobs for people in coastal communities. A recent World Bank study estimated millions of jobs for people in coastal communities from expanding seaweed cultivation. Um, 
currently, particularly in the developed the developing world, um, a lot of seaweed cultivation is done by women. So it could also advance um, SDG five on gender equality. Um, also, as we've already sort of heard, could um, have benefits for SDG 14 on life below water, you know, helping to um, improve marine, improve the health of marine ecosystems, support fish populations, uh, combat coastal eutrophication. But it does also present risks. You know, there have been concerns expressed about um, the potential for in introduction of non-native uh, seaweed species in different areas, um, the potential for uh, marine pollution from synthetic ropes and, and other materials. Um, so I think it's it's fair to say, I mean, this is not a, an exhaustive list, but it's, it's intended to just illustrate how sort of different techniques could have both sort of benefits and drawbacks in terms of, of the SDGs. And we still don't have, I would argue, a really good understanding of all of the different interactions between different ocean CDR techniques and the SDGs. And that's in part because there's still a lot of uncertainty around um, ocean CDR. There is, as I said, this need for additional research and in particular in ocean um, sort of research of control, sort of of the type of controlled field studies. Um, so it's important that we have a governance framework that facilitates that sort of in-ocean research, um, but also ensures that it occurs in a safe and responsible way that doesn't present undue risks, for example, to sustainable development. And I would argue that doesn't um, currently exist. So if we think about the global climate regime um, throughout the United Nations Framework Convention on climate change and the Paris Agreement, um, there is a recognition, I think, of the link between climate change and sustainable development. There is an emphasis in the Paris Agreement that, you know, we need to align climate action with sustainable development. The Paris Agreement also recognizes that um, one of the climate actions we might want to take is um, what they what's referred to as the conservation and enhancement of greenhouse gas sinks. Um, and the term sink is defined very broadly. Definition is certainly broad enough to encompass ocean CDR techniques that um, remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So the Paris Agreement um, supports, at least implicitly, the use of ocean CDR to combat climate change. Um, it also says that uh, ocean CDR and other actions to address climate change um, should be pursued in a manner that's consistent with and that advances sustainable development. But it doesn't sort of offer um, really detailed guidance on how to achieve that sort of sustainable ocean CDR. And there is, in fact, um, currently no comprehensive, legally binding international governance framework specific to ocean CDR. Um, there are, though, a number of international agreements that deal with uh, ocean access, marine pollution, species protection, and other issues that could have relevance to ocean CDR. And the parties to some of those agreements have adopted um, non-binding resolutions and decisions dealing with specific ocean CDR activities, most notably ocean fertilization, and um, with sort of geoengineering more broadly. Um, the, those decisions and resolutions approach um, sort of ocean CDR and geoengineering from a position of, sort of skepticism and impose significant restrictions on it. So this is one example it's, it was adopted by the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity in 2010, um, basically says that geoengineering activities should not occur, includes this exception, you can see underlined here, for small scale scientific research studies that would be conducted in a controlled setting. Um, the resolution itself doesn't explain what is a controlled setting. Um, some scholars have argued that really only research that's conducted in a laboratory or a, a mesocosm type research would qualify. Um, but as I said before, what we really need is in ocean research. So many have argued that um, this exception is, is essentially useless. Um, the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity justified this um, very sort of strict controls on geoengineering by pointing to the scientific uncertainty regarding its efficacy, benefits, and risks. And so given that uncertainty, they say they will take a precautionary approach and restrict these activities. Um, you know, I think you could argue that um, this is appropriate. Some would argue that this is appropriate and consistent with the precautionary principle that underlies a lot of international environmental law. 
But um, on the other side, you can also argue that it's quite a narrow and um, one-sided sort of interpretation of the precautionary principle. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on this because I think I'm probably out of time, but I do just want to note that this idea of um, precaution is also reflected in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which says um, that the parties should take precautionary measures to address climate change and that where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing such measures. Um, you know, it could be argued that climate change is now causing serious and irreversible damage, including to the ocean. And so um, lack of full scientific certainty around the efficacy, benefits and risks of ocean CDR shouldn't um, delay or restrict research. Um, so we see this, I would argue, this disconnect between the global climate regime and the global sort of ocean governance regime. Um, one reason for that, I think, is because the, the global ocean governance regime doesn't fully recognize the risks posed by climate change, um, focuses on the, the risks associated with ocean CDR um, research uh, and deployment, but doesn't focus on the, the risks of failing to pursue those activities. Um, so I would argue that we need to really rethink international governance of ocean CDR and craft a governance framework that facilitates needed research while ensuring that it takes place in a safe, responsible and sustainable way. Um, and that in order to achieve those outcomes, any new governance framework must take sort of a new approach to risk assessment that accounts both for the risks associated with ocean CDR, but also for the risks associated with um, unmitigated climate change. So I will leave it there and hand back to Linda. Great, thank you so much, Romani. It's, it's very interesting to see how, uh, how the work also spills over to other um, SDGs. It's always nice to see the, the correlation out there. And uh, next up we have uh, Christian, so I will hand it over to you. Great. Fantastic. Good. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, all's good. Good. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much. And, and terrific to have um, the uh, opening presentations from uh, Brian and Romney. And, and to some degree, I'll, you know, I'll try not to repeat um, some of what they uh, what they said. Um, I, I think, you know, when we when we think about um, the uh, carbon dioxide removal, you know, and, and, the, and using the ocean of it, I think it is certainly um, ocean CDR is, or CDR has been held back in international climate policy discussions for fear that it would remove the urgency of emissions reductions. But I think we're now facing a future of CDR of some form that we're needing to be part of a suite of uh, solutions. Um, and uh, unlike land-based methods, the sea provides us with you know, far more space, you know, a full 70% of the planet's surface. This means having more area to scale up carbon capturing technologies across the, you know, across the planet. And indeed the the, uh, the ocean is one of the Earth's natural carbon seeks, a reservoir more than 50 times bigger than the planet's atmosphere. So, you know, incredible sort of opportunity that's there. Um, and, and really using the ocean can diversify the portfolio of solutions we have to address uh, the climate uh, crisis. And many approaches could theoretically be deployed in places where they wouldn't compete for other uses of land, um, or at least other uses of the ocean. And so we avoid some of this competition that you might find on, on land. Um, just by way of a background and now, some of you may be familiar with WRI's um, carbon removal work. Um, this really started after the IPCC report in 2018 uh, that said that CDR is needed. And we had three working papers that were these foundational papers on um, so foundational questions on uh, carbon removal, um, and then one on technical CDR, and then one on CDR and forests and farms in, in the United States. And, and with each, we did an assessment of, of the landscape status and key questions around potential approaches. And then in January 2020, we launched Carbon Shot, which followed the National Academies of Science's foundational paper on a federal research agenda to advance the field. And uh, certainly some of our current work is really looking at some of those uh, naughty and tricky questions around enhanced oil recovery and the environmental impacts of direct air uh, capture. Um, we, we have a really unique uh, um, situation where we sit um, at the as the secretariat for the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. You have 17 serving world leaders to advance a sustainable ocean economy. And really a lot of what our work, and I'll tell say a little bit about it in a moment, um, has been driven by the priorities of these uh, the members of the, the high level panel where ocean-based carbon capture storage is included 
in a uh, politically endorsed uh, uh, series of recommendations and ocean-based climate solutions uh, that came out um, in 2019 and 2020. And so in both cases, when you look at the ocean-based climate solutions and the series of recommendations that these heads of state came out on, um, the potential for long-term carbon removal and storage was identified, but clearly, and as Romney said, uh, and this was endorsed by these heads of state, there was a need for more research and on the science, on the impacts, uh, it was certainly emphasized there. Um, in addition to the IPC telling us that, that carbon removal will be necessary, CDR also has become an important policy of, uh, uh, or part of climate policy strategies. And WRI has undertaken research into ocean-based climate solutions in the mid-century low emission strategies developed by countries pursuant to the Paris Agreement. And 53 in total have now communicated uh, with 25 included using technological carbon removal here shown in yellow. And notably the US, Japan and Norway uh, also included ocean-based CDR and CCS specifically. The others don't mention either land or ocean-based approaches specifically. But um, you know why uh, ocean CDR needs further attention investment. You've heard a little bit about that from, uh, from Romney. Um, but uh, you know, really, we're seeing a rise in the net zero pledges and a growing interest from countries, investors, project developers, et cetera. But because it's controversial, there's a tendency to avoid it, uh, push it to later on. But the issue is going ahead. So we need to certainly uh, address it. There is scientific uncertainty associated with most of the ocean-based CDR approaches. You've heard this earlier by previous speakers. So additional theoretical laboratory scale and small scale at sea testing is needed before really the merits and, and trade-offs can be uh, addressed uh, or adequately uh, evaluated. Um, there are some complexities with ocean CDR, uh, without a doubt. Uh, it makes it more complex than land-based, um, which is already complex and, and controversial. Uh, there's generally a smaller knowledge base uh, around the proposed ocean CDR, CDR approaches. Um, most have only been proposed or modeled in laboratory settings, so um, there's an uncertainty about their efficacy, which needs to be certainly considered. Um, the ocean is a dynamic and interconnected uh, place and moving, so impacts cannot be contained in, in one area. Um, this can also make monitoring and verification very difficult, particularly the further we, you move away from shore, where the ocean itself is less um, understood, less explored, you know, etc. Uh, you heard about the lack of international governance frameworks uh, that has caused ambiguity and different interpretations of how to understand ocean CDR in the context of existing international framework or governance. And, and the other certainly key dimension of this is, is because of the cultural and emotional significance the ocean holds, public perception and social license will be important uh, in this in this dimension. Um, and really, you know, we, we also looking at the, you know, some of the work that we've highlighted around the equity and social impacts of ocean CDR, which is a, a bigger focus in the recent National Academies paper, as well as WRI's new strategic plan, but hasn't been emphasized in the uh, literature on this topic as much. And so there's a clear focus uh, on equity and stakeholder engagement in developing and deploying these approaches. Um, I, I just wanna say that, that I think is often the case in, in choices around developing and deploying ocean CDR are about trade-offs and understanding the risks and potential negative impacts uh, of, of ocean CDR approaches in comparison to other, um, uh, to, to a scenario of, of climate change impacts where ocean CDR is not on the table and how the calculus changes as impacts of ocean, uh, at least of, of climate change, you know, worsen. The ideal situation, of course, would be that we are able to deploy ocean CDR in such a way that, that climate impacts are reduced and potential negative impacts of ocean CDR to environment and people are minimized. So we are choosing one or the other, which is you know, shown here, but this will require more research and small scale testing is better to understand the uncertainties and, and risks. And there's no internationally accepted framework for, uh, uh, for assessing those comparative uh, risks. Um, and then finally, briefly, what I'd, I just wanna to touch on, a, um, you know, given the background and, and recognizing the urgency to advancing dialogue on this topic, WRI will be uh, uh, publishing a report ahead of COP27 uh, that'll unpack the issue of ocean CDR and perhaps offer some recommendations. I wanna to touch on just a couple of those because this I think is relevant to this discussion, but it, this report really distills the potential scale of carbon dioxide removal, expected costs, risks, and co-benefits and areas of research needed to for the seven ocean CDR approaches. Um, you, you saw this uh, same graphic that Romney had just shown, but really our report 
you know, looks at the same uh, seven main approaches of OCDR that were featured in the literature and the broader um, uh, ocean uh, CDR you know, discussion. Um, I think each, you know, each of the uh, the approaches falls along the spectrum of risk, CDR opportunity, cost, and technical technological readiness. And uh, you know, our pro our pro our report uh, touches on a number of those uh, dimensions. Within the report itself, we touch on some of the governance needs, and that under each solution, and each solution will need a code of conduct that the global community can agree on. And this might mean setting a, a space uh, setting space standards for seaweed farms or identifying where and how alkalinity enhancement could be carried out. And when we talk about uh, robust governance of ocean, uh, ocean CDR, this is what we mean in you know, a number of dimensions uh, of that. Um, when we think about some of the uh, the existing uh, legal frameworks, I don't want to touch on this. I think the, the main point that Romney touched on is that there's a real patchwork and, and many predate the concept of ocean CDR so that they're in place to regulate other marine activities. Um, and so, uh, for most of the ocean CDR approaches we discussed, it becomes a matter of legal interpretation on a case by case basis, considering the method, the size, and whether they're ancillary structures, et cetera. Um, we do have some signals, expressions of concern and emphasis on the need for science, which provide limited guide rails, but not regulation. Um, the, uh, um, and, and considering the opportunities presented by um, uh, emerging development pathways, the global climate community must strive not just to develop ocean CDR approaches based on carbon removal efficacy and cost, but also develop ocean CDR approaches responsibly, including not pursuing development of environmental and ecological risks um, are, are shown to outweigh uh, expected benefits. And, and really ultimately ocean CDR deployment and unabated climate change involve a trade-off between different sets of risk. And this report will advance an approach that is centered on informed and responsible development and deployment of ocean CDR in order to appropriately balance the urgency of emissions reductions and precautionary approach for environmental and social risks in uh, ocean CDR. Um, we came up with a series of, of uh, you know, priorities of, of actions around strong governance frameworks that are really important to expand, understand, and scientific uncertainty, uncertainty of the application of carbon remo removal. Um, and, and this really is a, you know, is a, is a very important dimension as we look at this and, and taking this forward. And hopefully this is a, a good basis by which um, uh, a more robust discussion can, can, can be undertaken um, in various in various fora. Uh, and then finally, in addition to the broader recommendations that which apply to governments, research institutions, UN bodies, private sector, we pulled out an additional set of focus recommendations aimed at the potential role of philanthropy in this space. And I know this is certainly something that's being explored um, and really grouped into two pillars around convenings and dialogues and, uh, and innovation. And we've certainly seen uh, a number of these uh, innovations and uh, technological prizes, um, but this report then starts to unpack and go into more of that. So with that, I hopefully give a few insights onto some of the work that we've been involved with and no doubt you'll be interested to see the report when it comes out, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Christian. That was a very informative uh, um, breakdown for sure on, on your work, so very well done. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, philanthropy. I think that's a very hot topic these days um, when we're talking about more, more funding and more, more engagement from, from various areas. Uh, I just want to remind people to please uh, post questions. Uh, Brian and Sai are doing a really great job to answer those in the Q&A box, but don't feel shy to post more. Um, so last week we have Andy, so I will just hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to join this very distinguished and interesting panel. Let me share screen. I'm having trouble getting to the top. Here we go. Okay. Voila. Okay. So just to start, um, uh, just in all transparency, I retired from the United Nations Development Program about two weeks ago. So I'm here in my personal capacity. But in any event, I would have had the same presentation if I was formally employed by UNDP or not. But uh, so. Um, 
you know, my background before I was involved for 26 amazing years at UNDP with ocean and water governance, I was mainly schooled in the areas of chemical oceanography and marine geochemistry. And so um, one thing marine geochemists like to do is try to look at big, big picture issues and problems and, and challenges in the ocean with what you could call simple back of the envelope calculations, sort of looking at some of these questions. And so when I learned over the past years of uh, you know, the growing interest in the potential for the ocean as a, a solution to climate change, or at least a partial solution, including through things like uh, nutrient uh, enrichment or enrichment of the surface ocean, uh, but of course, more recently, the idea of macroalgae cultivation and, and sinking as a carbon dioxide uh, removal um, approach. And so that made me wonder, okay, what if we did it to the max? What, in other words, what if we looked at the ocean as the entire solution to anthropogenic uh, carbon dioxide emissions and, and, and a full scale up of that? What would be the impact of that in particular on oxygen in the ocean? And so that's what this little thought experiment I'm gonna take you through is going to do. Okay, just some backgrounds, of course. We wanna always remember climate change is not just an issue of too much CO2 in the atmosphere. It's all so it's really an issue of too much CO2 in the whole ocean atmosphere system. As we heard from others today, the ocean has already absorbed around 30% of anthropogenic CO2. The ocean is acidifying at the highest rate in definitely in tens of million years, possibly in the history of the planet, it's quite possible. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding that carbon dioxide, when it goes into the ocean, most of it is not going into biota. The ocean has, as we've heard, tons of CO2. Most of it is just dissolving, forming carbonic acid and the other species of carbonic acid, bicarbonate and carbonate uh, ions. It's not being taken up by marine organisms in the in an aggregate. And we all know, you know, some of the models in the business as usual emission scenario, ocean acidity would increase another 250 percent by 2100. pH ocean, which has already fallen 0.1 units, would fall another 0.3 units. It would be, you know, a catastrophic scenario for the ocean without question. And the other numbers I like to share with people, just to put some of these ideas in perspective, if you look at all the fossil fuel reserves on Earth, the oil, the gas, the coal, they were formed in a multitude of different events, many of these oceanic, not, not only, but many of them, over you know, multiple hundreds of millions of years. So here we come in the last really 200 years, we're pretty much extracting and burning a lot of them, a good chunk of them, in a, you know, an order of a few hundred years. So if you put the ratio of that 100, 100 million years, 10 to the eighth, over 100 years, 10 to the second, that's a million. We're burning the stuff about a million times faster, putting it back into the atmosphere ocean system, about a million times faster than it took natural process, processes to put it there. And, and those kind of numbers get me a little concerned when I start hearing about nature-based solutions, quite honestly. And that you know, ties into what I'm gonna share with you. Okay, so our simple assumptions for this, this, this very simple thought experiment is that we're gonna mitigate all of carbon emissions globally, which is about 10 billion metric tons of carbon per year. Uh, to try to minimize the, whatever the impacts of all this cultured seaweed would be, we're going to spread it across the entire ocean, both horizontally and vertically through the entire water column. Uh, in other words, the idea of diluting the impacts, whatever they might be, uh, the maximum amount. And then we assume that the vast majority of the seaweed, uh, either on the way down or once it reaches the sea bottom, is metabolized or respired back to CO2. Uh, and I couldn't find much research on the rate of decomposition and so forth of kelp and other seaweeds, but one study found that it decomposes about 0.74% per day and averages about 50% decomposition after 67 days. And I guess the message being there that it seems that most seaweed does ultimately decompose uh, even you know, in, the, in a deep sea environment. Okay. So good geochemists, they don't talk uh, metric tons or grams, they use moles. So that's what chemists use. So it's very simple to convert the 10 billion metric tons of carbon uh, to moles. Uh, you multiply by the grams per metric ton, a million grams per metric ton. You divide by the atomic weight of carbon, 12 grams per mole. You get about 8.3 times 10 to 14 moles carbon per year. That's the anthropogenic carbon emissions that we need to mitigate on an annual basis. And the, the, the chemical equations here are really classical simple equations that basically their their photosynthesis the production of the seaweed in the surface ocean shown by this generic equation on the left and then of course the respiration of the seaweed by by bacteria by other metabolic processes in the deep sea back to co2 and back to to water consuming oxygen so for every molecule or mole of, of co2 carbon that's converted to organic carbon 
via photosynthesis, it's then later respired back to the same amount, the same molecule of CO2 uh, and, and water. So it's a one-to-one, -one, very simplistic um, uh, stoichiometry, as chemists are called. Okay, and this is a, a small element of the calculation. You take the average ocean depth, 3682 meters. We, we subtract the mixed layers, say of about 100 meters, get 3582. So basically about 97% of the ocean is that below the mixed layer. The total volume of the ocean is about 1.3 times 10 to the 21st liters. And so you just multiply that, that slight correction, 0.973. So the, the volume of ocean we would be um, impacting, again, in this very, uh, you know, you'll see in a moment, impossible scenario is about 1.26 times 10 to the 21st liters of seawater. Okay, and then look at oxygen. The average oxygen concentration in the ocean uh, below the mixed layer, if you look at the, the average between the Pacific and Atlantic, it's about three and a half milligrams per liter, uh, plus or minus, but again, the exact number is not that important. Convert that to moles, that's 1.09 times 10 to the minus fourth moles per liter. So very simple, you multiply the concentration of oxygen in the ocean times the total volume below the mixed layer, you get the total moles of oxygen in the ocean, 1.37 times 10 to the 17th moles. Okay, so if you divide, based on the stoichiometry I just showed, if you divide the total moles of carbon per year uh, to be mitigated through the ocean seaweed mitigation strategy, by the total amount of oxygen in the ocean, you get about 0.61%. About 0.61% of all the ocean oxygen in the ocean would be consumed in this scenario, okay? Then if, for example, you carried on that same scenario for 100 years, uh, you would consume 61%, 100 times 0.61 or 61% of the ocean uh, oxygen over that period. Now, um, I'm not the first person to look at this question. And of course, I looked at it in, in this very back of the envelope sense. Um, other scientists have looked at this. Um, Wu et al. in a preprint pre -pre -print earlier this year did a much more sophisticated Earth system model. They projected by 2100, ocean oxygen would decrease by about 25%, by 23, by 3000, by 50%. Very important observation because of a couple of effects, um, mainly the canopy shading effect, that is the shading that the kelp or other seaweed might cause impacting normal product ship production by ocean uh, plankton, as well as competition. Uh, the surface ocean is very not uh, well endowed in, in, in nutrients in general. And so there'd be, there'd be very tight competition between these macro algae that are being cultured and the natural phytoplankton. And there they calculated a net 20% global reduction in net primary productivity. That's total primary productivity of the ocean. That's immense uh, amount. Uh, in turn, because of this less primary productivity, they calculated the net reduction in the in the effect of the macroalgae sink, uh, uh, you know, impact would also be about 37%. So it would be diminished impact of the overall, uh, you know, sink mitigation effect. And of course, if you uh, impact net primary productivity in the ocean, either at a global scale or, of course, at, at local and regional scales, you're going to, th those impacts, you know, reverberate right up the food chain to the zooplankton, to the fish, and so forth. So it would have massive impacts on fisheries and presumably on fisheries yields in areas where this was, was concentrated. Okay, but needless to say, to do what I, the initial scenario of spreading this evenly over the whole ocean, both horizontally and vertical, it's impossible. You couldn't do that. And so that, that means basically where where the cultivation and sinking were concentrated would experience much more rapid and significant deoxygenation, as well as the, the, just the impacts I just summarized on, on primary productivity and on marine ecosystems. There's been, I think some have suggested that the kelp could be buried under the accumulating deep sea sediments, but deep sea sediments, they accumulate at the rate of a few centimeters per thousand years. Uh, very little of the, most people don't realize, very, very little of the organic carbon that forms in the surface oceans from photosynthesis actually survives its way back. Most of it is recirculated in the surface ocean. And only about typically one to a few percent actually makes it to the deep sea sediments. And then even there, uh, a lot of it is broken down through what are known as what's known as sedimentary diagenesis, bacterial, you know, remobilization of the material. The suggestion that the deep ocean could be, you know, reventilated with new atmospheric oxygen over these kinds of time frames, even a hundred years, misses the fact, uh, I think Brian touched on this, the global ocean mixes on a time scale of around 2000 years. So you could not reventilate the ocean uh, if, you can, you know, if you conducted this kind of uh, massive scaling up. Uh, and of course, eventually this CO2 that would build up in the ocean and of course the associated acidity that it would build up in the deep ocean 
would eventually return to the surface ocean on this time frame of a few thousand years of the ocean mixing cycle, and that would reinvigorate uh, a climate change, unfortunately. Okay, so the conclusion of this, I agree, simple, admit simple, but I think instructive um, thought experiment is that this cultivation and sinking of macroalgae for climate mitigation purposes should probably, and, and Christian got at some of the caveats of this very well, I appreciate that, should really be studied, obviously, should be done at most at a modest scale to avoid what, you, as I think you could see, could be quite significant negative impacts on marine ecosystems. And so overall, it could be you know, a niche solution, a small solution, I'm guessing a few percent to do it safely, so to speak, uh, to overall climate mitigation. Uh, and of course, as Kristen got at very eloquently, we would wanna have very systematic scientific studies, monitoring and verification of the true impacts, the true sequestration uh, impacts of this exercise. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say congratulations on uh, your retirement and congratulations on a job very well done. I mean, you have so much experience. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yes, yeah, so we are now on to the Q&A session and I can see that our panelists are riding full speed ahead with the answers for these questions. So I thought maybe we can even elaborate a little bit on those. Uh, and I can see, Romani, that you're currently uh, responding to one of these questions. Uh, is there any relevant international law that regulates uh, OCDR projects in high seas? So maybe if you want to start with that, and then you can also type your, your answer in the yeah, in the Q&A if you want. Sure. Um, I guess the short answer of what I was going to say was um, really not in a comprehensive way. Um, I guess there's a few issues to think about when we're talking about projects on the high seas. Um, you know, one is that international law um, does not have sort of force for private actors, non-government actors um, by itself. And so we really need to think about how international law is implemented at a domestic level. Um, and so there are international agreements like the London Convention and Protocol, for example, um, that direct countries to establish permitting regimes for, um, in the case of the London Convention and Protocol, ocean dumping. Um, and those permitting regimes can sometimes apply to activities on the high seas. For example, the way that the US has, has implemented the London Convention domestically, um, a permit is required if you're using a US vessel to dump something on the high seas. Um, and so it really comes down to sort of the, the country um, implementing those domestic regimes. But as I said, and I think as Christian said, um, you know, there's no comprehensive legal framework for ocean CDR anywhere, um, including on the high seas. Um, there's just this sort of patchwork of existing agreements that um, we're trying to fit ocean CDR within. Um, and it's often not a particularly good fit because those agreements were developed for other activities and don't um, directly anticipate ocean CDR, don't address the sort of unique um, issues that it might present. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, it definitely sounds a bit <laughs> trickier than, than a very straightforward answer on that one. Um, let's see here. I'm going to Go through. I'm actually going to go back to uh, to the start of the questions. So, Sai, you already answered it a little bit. Uh, what are the barriers to scale up? I'm assuming this was related to seaweeds, if I remember correctly. So, I don't know if you also want to uh, jump in, or if any other one want to jump in on that one. Maybe Brian. Happy to uh, chime in that I think we need to uh, build an, a sufficient capital for these kind of clean tech solutions that would enable uh, what's going to be an existential crisis for our civilization. And that is, can we continue to have food security in a climate disrupted world or in a disrupted world, whether it's political disruptions or climate disruptions, food security is going to be front and center. And in a world where marine ecosystems are collapsing, can we even support the billion people that depend on the oceans today? That's front and center. And the reality is there's replete nutrients in the twilight zone between 100 meters and 1,000 meters down. There's no limitation on nitrate and phosphate availability. So by um, restoring natural upwelling, we can actually enable that to go and uh, address you know, some of the questions that have been raised during this panel. But that's those are a couple of the barriers that I think we need to address, starting one hectare at a time. And there's probably thousands of communities that would love to have a hectare near nearby their community to ensure greater 
circular economies as well as um, circular ecosystems. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're you're definitely correct on that. And um, there was another question uh, also relating to this. If uh, there are any experiences on uh, public resistance for seaweed projects? I think we do need to be cognizant of some of the questions that Andrew raised. Uh, one of them is deep oxygen. And you know, there's plenty of oxygen at the bottom for the kind of hectare scale marine permaculture that we're doing. I think it's important to understand that pre-industrially in the subtropical waters, we saw 30 to 40% higher algae production than we see today. And a lot of it is because the macronutrient is not available in the mixed layer. So if you're an abyssal creature, let's say you're a benthic creature, and you've got 30% less marine snow than you had pre-industrially, your populations aren't going to be doing very well. And the reality is just getting back to pre-industrial levels of algae productivity would be desirable. We've been able to document 3,000 square kilometers of lost kelp forest in the last century alone, just in two nations of the United States and Australia. Imagine if we could document the, the lost square kilometers of seaweed forest in the other 198 nations, uh, you know, how much have we lost? I mean, it's thousands and thousands of square kilometers. So let's work on getting a little bit closer to free industrial levels before we worry too much about what we're going to be doing to the ocean. I think one hectare at a time, there are plenty of experiments we can do and really measure and, and encourage third party observations and validation of um, safety as we go forward. Yeah, I like the one hectare at a time. That seems like a, a reasonable approach. And I can see that, Christian, you have your hand up. Would you like to add something? Yeah, I, I just want to maybe just t tie a couple of these threads together, which I think are really interesting, what Brian raised and Romney touched on, and Simon Andrew, maybe kind of just offer a, a thought on that. Um, there's a lot of discussion at the moment around, you know, how you get, get multiple wins out of a single investment in the ocean space, right? And so, um, you know, this notion of co-location of activities. You know, for example, I know that the offshore wind community is looking at, you know, not only can provide a, a low carbon source of energy, but in and around, amongst around these facilities and farms, can you be growing seaweed or other forms of aquaculture to address food security? And so I, I think the ocean represents, you know, we shouldn't think of just uh, ocean CDRs as in isolation. I think Romney touched on this very nicely in bringing in the SDGs. You know, we think it at, at the multiple touch points. You know, so yes, you know, let's let's deal with you know carbon, but let's also deal with issues around food security. But thinking about this in in the developing context around uh, you know issues around economic development, poverty, jobs, you know, etc. And I think um, you know it really behooves the discussion around ocean CDR just to not think of it as a, a you know very sort of um, it's either it's a either or. We need to think about the other opportunities that it that it really provides, and I. I I think it's really important in the broader context of the of the SDGs. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I agree with you to get a higher impact. You definitely definitely need to include other components as well. Um, I can see here one question uh, that says, when Andy says modest, how does that relate to the scales that Dr. Von Hatzen is proposing? So I saw, Andrew, that you, you um, wrote a brief explanation. Would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, only to, you know, my analysis suggests, and I, I think the, 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 the paper I quoted as well, that, uh, you know, it could be a niche solution, no question. The kind of work Brian is, is doing, uh, it, which isn't, isn't just about carbon sequestration, it's about far more. It's about food production and so forth, very important things. Uh, it's about restoration of ecosystems that are indeed being damaged by reduced upwelling and, and reduced nutrient supply. So, you know, as a niche solution and in a, in, a, in a local solution to maybe, you know, diminished uh, fishing yields in certain parts of the world due to these impacts, you know, it's fine. But I'm, my main point is that scaling this up at a level to really address the problem at a global scale is to me not within reason, uh, but at a niche level, it's, it's, it's useful. I'd Great, like to so uh, quote Go ahead, some of, um, yeah, some of the Stanford studies, I think were helpful on this. Um, it was either Stanford or Princeton that discussed climate wedges and there are no silver, silver bullets when it comes to something as big as this. But if over uh, 10 or 20 years, we could build a climate wedge in the ocean as well as in the soils, we would be doing humanity a great service and perhaps the entire planet. Um, and so 
if on the way to ensuring food security in a disrupted world and ecosystem survival, because in my 50 years of diving in the ocean, I've witnessed decimations of uh, fish populations and certainly the World Wildlife Report that came out this week indicating that 70% of the world's vertebrates are gone today. You know, it's like, wake up, people. You know, we've got a planet that's falling apart. How far, you know, can we just step away from the cliff for a moment? I mean, we're just getting closer and closer to this cliff. You know, let's just step away. And for us, stepping away is getting a little closer to pre-industrial levels. And, you know, I um, it may be, I mean, if a niche is a gigaton, maybe we're we're satisfied with that. You know, it's not going to be do all of it. But we know that the oxygen flux from the Southern Ocean Antarctic bottom water supports about five gigatons of carbon oxidation in the deep sea. And we know the Labrador current also has an oxygen flux that will sustainably support on the order of five gigatons per year. So somewhere between maybe one gigaton and several, there'll be a sustainable level. Let's just work on getting the first megaton and then the, the, a few hundred megatons. Uh, and, and then let's monitor what's going on, see what the sustainable level is, and take it from there. I, I think an incremental approach is worthwhile. But that said, you know, how many more years does the planet have? We do need to step these things up and at least ensure the kind of food security and ecosystem regeneration that'll be needed to uh, continue survival for most of the species on this planet. Yeah, thank you so much, Brian. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you want to continue on to this uh, um, question that Michael posted. It says, what scale of carbon drawn down do we need to achieve by when to avoid catastrophic tipping points such as ocean acidification? Uh, I think anyone here could probably uh, jump in on that. But yeah, anyone who feels uh, ready to answer it, please go ahead. Uh, that's, you know, that's a tough one, but, um, you know, we need to combine this, this kind of toolbox of various drawdown approaches, both, both marine-based and, and presumably some terrestrial as well. But I truly believe that the biggest bang for our buck in moving toward the Paris Agreement and, and reducing our emissions is going to be through, you know, even further scaling up that's already, that has already occurred in energy efficiency, in renewable energy and so forth. And don't forget, we all know this in this group, I'm sure, there's currently, well, there is a few places, but there's not a, a consistent price on carbon. Needless to say, if there was a price put on carbon, the values of these ocean-based CDR things would, would increase dramatically, as well as the, the economic viability of a, a wide range of, of renewable and energy efficiency technologies. Most already renewables are cost competitive in many cases with, you know, with, with fossil fuels, solar, wind, and so forth. So if you had a carbon price driving that market further, it would make an enormous difference and it would clearly accelerate the transition to a, a much lower carbon economy. Yeah, thank you, uh, absolutely. Does anyone else have anything that they would like to add? I know we're running out of time, we're actually running over time, but <laughs> these are very important questions. I don't want to leave without having some answers. Um, Yes. Um, okay, I'll go to the last question, I think. And this one is probably for you, Romani, because you already answered it. But uh, again, I think, um, yeah, who is and who should be driving uh, updates to the regulatory legal regimes that govern OCDR? Yeah, I think Christian could probably weigh in on this as well. But, um, you know, so far, a lot of the discussion has been. Um, through the bodies that administer sort of the London Convention and the London Protocol, those two um, agreements deal with ocean dumping um, and so seem to have relevance to activities like ocean fertilization and some forms of ocean alkalinity enhancement that involve adding stuff to the ocean. Um, and so there's been um, in the past quite a lot of discussion around um, ocean fertilization in particular, but also what they class as sort of marine geoengineering. Um, in the context of those agreements, um, you know, I think we're also seeing more um, discussion of CDR generally and even ocean CDR specifically um, in the climate um, regimes, you know, at the COPs um, for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement. Um, but I think it's really important that we bridge those different um, sort of 
regimes, right? We need to sort of bring the climate experts together with the ocean governance experts so that we can craft an integrated regime that thinks about the climate implications, also thinks about sort of local impacts on, on the marine ecosystem um, because, because all of those different um, sort of bodies have expertise and have um, an important sort of stake here. Uh, so it's really, it's really about um, a lot of this, I think, from a legal perspective is about sort of breaking down silos and, and promoting that sort of integration. I just I just want to echo what Romney said there. I mean, absolutely, and breaking down the silos. Historically, you know, we've treated many things in the ocean, you know, in, in single silos. And, and the movement at the moment, not just for this particular topic, a range of whole other topics, we're seeing a much greater integration and, and cross-section and cutting across those. And so just to add on Romney, you know, I certainly would like to see this, you know, the biodiversity dimensions brought into this as well, right? You know, we need, and and as well as the, I touched on it briefly, the social and equitable dimensions, you know, it, there are, there, there's so many implications for this. Um, and we have a chance to get it right uh, and learning from some past mistakes and some of these uh, global commons. And so um, I think, you know, the final message which is be a plea for, you know, integration across uh, regulatory frameworks and and driving that forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, I really wish we had more time to have more in-depth discussions, but I'm sure there will be other uh, circumstances where we will all see you again. So uh, just to, to wrap up what we've uh, discussed right now, uh, unless anyone want to add anything before we're closing? Okay, I'm gonna take the silence as a no. <laughs> so uh, yes, thank you so much for, um, yeah, to all the panelists for, for this great participation and for all the great questions from the audience. So just a little wrap up from, uh, from what we just discussed now is that uh, first of all, we need to probably uh, mobilize more resources and capital for clean solutions to continue having, uh, for instance, food security and then ever insecure world basically. Um, and in order to move towards the price agreement, we also need to upscale energy efficiency and renewable technologies uh, in order to also reach a pre-industrial uh, CO2 level. And um, yes, what you also said is that we should not think of the oceans uh, in isolation, but we need to have multiple touch points uh, in order to deal with the bigger issues such as uh, carbon and food security, economy and employment. And then I'm going to finish with uh, Brian's very good quote, one hectare at a time. So I hope that we can take that, uh, that reasonable uh, vision and actually go one hectare at a time and hope that we can make a, a good impact. And so far from what I've seen today, it looks like we're moving in the right direction at least. So I hope that it will continue that way. So yes, again, thank you so much, the audience. Thank you so much to all the panelists. And I also want to mention a special thank you to the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge and the Center for Science and Policy and Cambridge Zero for their support. So, Thank you, everyone. And uh, in the Q&A, it also says that the recording will be shared, so you will also have the presentation. So I hope that you've enjoyed today and that everyone has learned something. And uh, yes, have a good weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Great. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that went really well. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, I think it was Pleasure. a really great uh, conversation. Yeah, the the audience, the number of the audience is a little surprising to me. <laughs> I guess I really Higher need though. to. 
I think I really need, need to heavily advise my events in, in LinkedIn and, and other occasions, yeah. Yeah, you'll always find um, that when you have an online event that you never get full numbers. It's more like half most right, of the time. Yeah, yeah things That's happen. That's what we've so. noticed. Thank you. Heather. Yeah. Well, 50 uh, was didn't seem too bad. There was the, the questions were engaging. Uh, do you, from some events, do you normally get more than that? Uh, this is the first uh, event I organized, so <laughs> I you yeah. don't feel bad about it. Honestly, when we hold events, when we hold online seminars, um, we always expect that we're not going to get the full amount. It's always normally about half or slightly more. So I think you've done really well. I think at one point I noticed 53 in total. Yeah, yeah. that sounds fine. I'm, I was very happy with that outcome, and thanks for organizing this. Do you go by Psi or by C? Uh, by C is fine. <laughs> See, yeah. Very good. Thank I know you. it's very, very late, uh, Brian. Yeah, I don't want to hold okay. it too much time. <laughs> no, that's fine. And thank you very much for coordinating and, and uh, really curating this event. Thank you. And I uh, will see you in a bit. <laughs> very good. Thanks. Thank Bye. you, Brian. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Lovely. I thought thank that went so really, much, really well, Steve. Yeah. yeah, you're more than welcome. I really enjoyed being part of it. So thank you. And for thank you for Lauren as well, getting me involved. I actually really enjoyed oh, thank working you so much. with you. I was kind of uh, stressed out, you know. <laughs> Even though I'm, I didn't mostly do anything, I'm not a moderator, I'm not a host. I just stay, uh, but I'm stressful. No, it, it ran really, really well. We were all on time, went over, but we made sure we answered all the questions, which was really good. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah, the presentations were very interesting. So I think it was a really, really good event. So you should be proud. Yeah, I, you know, when I see, I didn't see so many questions. I was wondering, oh, why not? I, I should have read all the slides and uh, pr prepare some good questions, but I just don't have time. No, I think a lot of the time, most people just listen and then it takes a while for them to actually pick up in writing yeah. a question. But um, I think the questions were really good and we had quite a good number of questions. So um, yeah, what I'll do is um, obviously this is recorded. So once it's downloaded, I will then send it over to you um, and then yeah, you can go from there. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Hannah. Lovely. You're welcome. And if ever you need any help again with any other events, do come to me because I'm always happy to help. Great. Thank you so much. Great to hear that. And I will. Don't no. worry, sure. <laughs> well, you take care of yourself and have a lovely weekend. You too. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.